Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this talk is about our engineering the loose salient or lost salient. I'm going to use the word loose because it's uh, particularly from an English point of view. Um, 1915 to 2018. Now, a number of people have asked me, why 2018? So, well, here's a, a traditional, rather illustrated idea of the Battle of Loos, drawn by Ralph Cleaver and taken from the graphic on the 15th of December, 1915. I'm going to go first of all to a definition of the word salient. So a military position that projects into the position of the enemy. Now, any advance into an enemy position might create a temporary salient. So we've got to throw into the mix some context of longevity. And more on that too in a minute. Now, looking at the word engineering or the definition of engineering as opposed to engineer, we've got here the application of scientific and mathematical principles to practical ends such as the design, manufacture, and operation of efficient and economical structures, machines, processes, and systems. You might say that only engineer could come up with that defini definition of engineering. So there we have it. Engineering the loss-lose salient, 1915 to 2018, more of which later. So first off, I'm just going to show you where Los Anguel is. Uh, north of Lens, south of La Baze on the front line. You can see how close it is. It's within sort of uh, 60 miles from the French coast. And we can see here very briefly, it drops off the northern edge of the Artois Plateau, which is in blue, dropping quite quickly, 120 feet in less than 300 yards, gradually melding it into the gentle gradients of the plain of Flanders to the northeast, over about 8 or 10 miles. So in any impending conflict or battle here, we can see immediately that geography and geology are going to be key factors in deciding where to locate defences and deciding how best to attack them. So before we get to the battle, and I'm going to look at the battle in a little bit of detail, I want to look at a few pre-war considerations. This is Los Anguel before 1914. What you're looking at here is the famous Tower Bridge, uh, the grandstand it was called, which is the crassier behind it. Uh, substantially re-engineered geography or landscape before the war. So pre-1914, the area was very agricultural, very economically challenged. Um, at the turn of the century, um, increasingly more important share of France's coal output. So within 50 years, uh, a, a big change. Now, since the discovery of coal in 1849, the entire region very quickly became dotted with new mine workings. Puy, fosses, all the paraphernalia, if you like, of a, of a coal mining region. Uh, in effect, it was a stitch up, the whole area between two dominant franchises, La Compagnie de Mines de Bethune and La Compagnie de Mines de Lens, which was much bigger, of course, than the, the, the Bethune. They began extracting coal about four years later. Now, all of you will recognize this, there's no captions on this. The detritus from these workings, all the coal mining's workings, whether they're conical or flat, it still gives this region its unique silhouette, a most unique silhouette uh, on the landscape today. Now, in the very early days, mine owners soon got very rich and became wealthy even if their employees did not. Now, each foss or puy quick, quickly sprouted uh, a mass of cheaply built terraced housing called corrons. Uh, to accommodate the thousands of workers needed for the coal industry, uh, many of them coming from other parts of Europe, including Poland, a lot from Poland, a lot from the area of Silesia. At cost became, as coal became king, highly experienced miners became fated and living standards gradually rose, so everybody was winning at that point. And the garden city to the south of Luz, known as the Enclosure, um, to others at the time it was known as Welling Garden City, uh, represents a more enlightened approach to providing workers with good living standards. Um, but profit and prosperity came to an abrupt end in 1914 as Germany invaded France. Now, by the middle of October 1914, after a stout defence by the French, together with the, the, the community of Lens, together with its outlying communities of Los Anguel on the left and Vermel on the right were quickly captured by the Germans. And they began to exploit for their own gain the potential wealth through coal of the region that they were occupying. 
In the first battle of the Artois, the famous race for the sea, as the BEF attacked north of the Labazé Canal, again another illustration from this time war illustrated, uh, to turn the enemy flank, the French recaptured Vermel after fierce fighting in December, and the front lines were now starting to form uh, around the time, uh, uh, this time, as they would be in September 1915, but we're talking about 12 months earlier at this point. Now, the second Battle of Artois, in May and June 15, saw French attacks principally towards the Lorette Spur and Vimy Ridge, and British attacks not shown on this plan, north of the Labazé Canal at Festubert and Ober Ridge, actually Ober Ridge first, then Festubert. Both gained some ground, three kilometers approximately, but incurred rather stinging casualties. So approximately 130,000 men uh, casualties, of which about 28,000 were British. Now two regiments of infantry, in, interestingly, this is just an aside, the 114th and 125th had undertaken a diversionary attack at Luz on the 9th of May as part of this battle, but they were beaten back by a very strong German defence. And I think it's probably an ominous foretaste of things to come. Now, Marshal Joseph Papa Joffre, even before the dust had settled on Second Artois, he was preparing for an autumn campaign to comprehensibly remove the Germans from French soil. Now, this is a rather strange period for, for the British and the French uh, Entente at this particular period, and it, it sort of reflects, if you like, the realities of almost coalition warfare, because between this point in time and the Battle of Luz, conferences now seem to be coming along like the proverbial London buses, nothing since the start of the war, and then four coming in quick succession. So we had Chantilly on the 7th, Saint-Omer on the 11th, Boulogne on the 20th, and then Frevent on the 27th of July. And the essence of the discussions at all of these is quite simple. Joffre wanted a substantial attack by the British either to the north of Lens to support his own third Artois offensive, or towards the Douai Plate, alternatively across the Somme uplands south of Arras to support his offensive in the Champagne. Either way, the emphasis was on the word substantial. But Joffre, the engineer, and French, the cavalrymen, were worlds apart. Because both had sought advice from their generals, who had very different views on the situation facing them. Foch could count on the benefits of a French army at their peak of their manpower and material output, and experience of large-scale attacks already under its belt. Haig had none of this. The BF had lost most of its pre-war regular complement of troops in the first year of the war. Ypres, Neuve-Chapelle, Oberridge and Festubert had accounted for them. The men of the new armies were not ready in quantity and quality to assume the mantle of battle. Moreover, the equipment and ammunition were nowhere near the quantities and qualities again needed to fight a substantial campaign. But fight they must. Now, Italy was stumbling on the Azonzo. A combined French and British force were failing to get beyond certain points at Gallipoli. And Russia on the brink of capitulation to Austro-German gains in the east. Now Kitchener, although he had previously favoured a very defensive policy, felt he had no option but to support the French in any way he could, with the utmost vigour and with all means possible. And by Joffre's insistence, north of Lons it would be, 12 miles of open country between the town itself and the La Base Canal, centred around the dour little tiny mining village of Los Anguel, which is here. So to French and Hague, it was the most unfavourable ground on which to fight. And I'll read this. It was the black country of France. This is by Sir Philip Gibbs, who wrote later about the battle. The black country of France scattered with mining villages in which every house was a machine gun fort with slag heaps and pit heads, which were formidable redoubts, with trenches and barbed wire and brick stacks, and quarries organized for defense in siege warfare. Cavalry may as well have ridden through hell with hope of exploiting success. So, Haig's plan of attack. This can be seen on the banner at the back. Ambitious or hopeless? Take your pick. Only six divisions up front and three in reserve in addition to five cavalry divisions to support any planned breakthrough. This was in the salient. There were plenty of subsidiary units also involved north of the canal. But no wonder Haig was a troubled man in the summer of 1915. 
Now, we had well, they, the Germans had well positioned and strong first and second line de German defences vulnerable only to siege. High vulnerability to machine gun and rifle fire in the attack, owing to the bare and open ground. And advantageous position for enemy artillery, concentration of fire, and almost impossible concealment of troop buildup due to superior enemy observation. Now, aside from the fact that the Germans had chosen where they wanted to defend, predominantly high ground with good drainage and open fields of fire, they'd also made sure that communications and supply lines were beneficial too. There's no point in having the best trenches in the world if you can't resupply them and communicate that you've done so. Now, although their pre-war manuals held sacrosanct at the time, the concept of defending the front line at all costs and counter-attacking to to actually attack uh, and take any ground that was lost. The Germans, to their credit, had by the summer of 15 already begun to develop what would eventually become a more elastic defense in depth policy. And that we would see more prominently later in the war, not quite at this stage. Nevertheless, from frontline positions, they were strongly defended and in more vulnerable areas, often supported by equal strong uh, second line support lines. And you can see those here, uh, the front lines just to the left of the British line, and then there was a Luz village line as well. I apologise if it's not coming out quite so well on this slide. So, redoubts were placed at key points and might take the form of heavily defended trench systems, often employing mine craters to facilitate better observation and other mine-made structures to increase fire potential, such as these brick stacks at Quinchy. Now, trenches supported some quite extraordinary disincentives to the attacker and even in 1915 dugouts were becoming seriously engineered structures. Also in the summer of 1915 the allied horse trading as to where and when to attack gave the Germans ample opportunity to construct a second even more stronger defensive system up to four miles in the rear and this, I'm pointing this out here the German second line at Luz. Much of it was sighted on reverse slopes, concealed by the enemy artillery observation, and with a field of fire, no pun intended, to die for. Here, barbed wire up to 15 yards thick in places could be laid with impunity, as enemy artillery had little effect at that range, even if it could be seen at all. Mutually supported redoubts, Stutzpunkt, were placed at key intervals on this line and in the villages, and cellars were turned into billets, ruins into machine gun posts. Even if the front line was breached, the enemy would clearly need time to regroup and re-equip, and so provide a breathing space for the Germans to deploy their own reserves to critical points in the line. Artillery was sighted far enough back to be outside the accuracy threshold and would have a 180 arc of fire, degree arc of fire, into any temporary salient being formed. And lastly, Every conceivable bit of high ground, whether natural or man-made, was employed and engineered for observation to support them. So, aside from the very real advantages of the enemy, Haig had a number of his own little local difficulties to contend with. Uh, acute shortage of heavy artillery for such a wide frontage, 18 miles in total. This included subsidiary. Shortage of ammunition for all calibres, a shortage of grenades and light mortars, and a shortage of men to do the job. So, not so problem, really. Right, back to our definition. We can see that Haig's tactical plan of attack to support the, alert, the Allied strategic imperative would be tricky, bearing in mind where the BEF was in the summer of 1915. So what could he conjure up, what could he engineer to mitigate its weaknesses? bearing in mind that the task of the engineer is to create a workable solution to a problem. Well, quite simply, it was smoke and mirrors. Well, not exactly. Actually, gas and diversion reaction and a good slice of luck into the bargain. British preparations for the battle had to be meticulous for Haig to have any chance of achieving his objectives. Gas was an expediency forced upon him and unfortunately, meticulousness and chance do not make good bedfellows. 
He did actually have a, a willing engineering force. At the start of the battle, he could draw on Royal Engineers field companies of all initial six infantry divisions, 18 of them. And in addition, each corps had two army troops companies, formerly fortress or special reserve companies, which were intended to use on infrastructure such as water supply, troop hutting and road and rail construction. Each new army and territorial division also had a pioneer battalion as part of its establishment and as part of First Army complement, four special companies for smoke and gas discharge and uh, three tunnelling companies for uh, tunnelling. In all, there were no less than 32 companies of active engineers involved in the build-up to the battle. And this doesn't include Royal Engineer Signals and Survey Companies, one of which every division had. So add to this the usual and substantial labour and fatigues parties supplied to the infantry, and one has a sizable amount of application of scientific methods. Moving on. At this point, as an adjunct, I'll just briefly in a few sentences describe the, the tunnelling situation at the time because uh, as a, a colleague I think expressed it to one of his talks in Scotland um, engineering isn't all about tunnelling which is quite correct. <laughs> tunnelling needs a bit more of a mention here largely because it had been going on astride the La Base Canal since the arrival of 170 Company in April 15. Now augmented by 1676 Company in July who took over the Combran sector from the French by the 25th of September, at least 24 mines in these two sectors had been fired uh, either side. So 24 mines south of the, the Combran Road and ab about as many under it. So you're looking at just under 50 mines being fired before September 25th. I'll just like to, to describe the gas, which uh, was the principal element of Haig's plan. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that without the gas, uh, he would have had no chance of any kind of potential success, let alone success. 5,500 gas cylinders actually transported up to the front line to um, start the battle on the 4th and 1st Corps front. Um, all in cylinders like that, extremely arduous, um, taking 8,000 men to actually do it on the day or, or on the, the, the session beforehand. Um, this particular image of the battle uh, is probably taken by an officer from 189 Special Company. In fact, it wouldn't have been. It would be the 5th London Rifle Brigade, who's had officers actually attached to 189 uh, in the southern sector near Double Crassier. And this was very probably taken by one of those officers, and it's probably looking at 6th City of London rifles as they're actually going over the top. Um, this is more likely to be the fog of war, if you like. I shall mention that further on uh, as we go down. Now, on the second division front in First Corps area, um, two mines were fired before the battle, or ten minutes before the battle. Now, we heard earlier on about mines being fired at, uh, at the Hawthorne Ridge ten minutes before the Battle of the Somme. Uh, two mines were fired also uh, north of the Combran Road in the Brickstacks area before the battle and two mines just south of the Combran Road uh, in 2nd Division area. Both gave forewarning to the enemy that uh, an attack was likely, and they pulled back from their line, and the mines had no effect whatsoever. Uh, the gas also had its share of, uh, shall we say, um, uh, well, put it this way, the gas didn't work at all in that particular area with 2nd Division. A lot of infantry started back from their reserve trenches, um, and actually were gassed as they were coming forward. Many of them, certainly second Argyles, didn't even get as far as their own trench after they'd come back. But a lot of heroics in the area. Uh, two particular, because this is a talk about engineering, uh, two engineers need special mention. James Lennox Dawson, obviously special gas company or special company RE, and Frederick Henry Johnson, 73rd Field Company with 15th Division. Um, I put that in really because we are talking engineering. Many, many more VCs and many, many awards for gallantry from Lewes. Now, effectively, um, this particular slide shows the Hohenzollern Redoubt being uh, at the beginning of the, of, of the action at the Hohenzollern Redoubt um, later in the October. And Brigadier Edmonds sums up really the Battle of Lewes in that sense, saying, courage, goodwill and fine physical condition though nearly sufficient to make soldiers, will not make armies. The standard of military knowledge, though in the circumstances extraordinarily high, was not high enough to command success. It was absurd to think that it could be. 
War is not a thing that can be quickly grasped by any person of intelligence or waged by anyone of spirit dressed in military uniform and armed. Troops must be led and there must be leaders in every rank. And in the latter part of 1915, these leaders were in the making. So you can agree with that or you may disagree with it. In the end, it's not my purpose here to make judgment on whether the battle was a partial success uh, or not. What we do have, though, at the end of the battle, which was closed down on the 14th of October, was a salient. Uh, so engineering the loose salient really kicks off from this point. Uh, it's not primarily about, about, about the Battle of Luz. Now, at the official closing down of the battle on the 14th, the line had stabilised into the form which would remain until almost April 1917. You can see Luz Crassier, <coughs> double Crassier, and up here you've actually got elements of the, just before the village of Hullock, uh, or Hulu as the French call it, and here we've got the Stutzpunk III. Now, more importantly, there was a growing realisation that the war was unlikely to be won or lost in the loose salient, and preparations for conducting it elsewhere were now firmly in hand. Now, towards the end of October, the need to dig in was supported by the need to dig under, and inevitably, like a virus, mine warfare spread its tentacles south from the Cambrun front to the village of Luz itself. Now, 180 Company, instrumental in supporting the initial attack at the Battle of Luz, had moved north while 251 Company had taken over the Brickstacks area opposite Quinchy. And this freed up the highly... Um, sorry, I've got the wrong slide. This freed up the highly experienced 170 Company under Frank Preedy, who moved south to begin work at the new sector, which was based around the Hohenzollern Redoubt. And from Chalk Pit Wood round to the bottom of Luz itself, engineers of French 9th Corps began to drive saps from the frontline trenches in anticipation of a German initiative. This new Hohenzollern sector, which is the famous redoubt here with little, Big Willy, Little Willy, would soon become as hot as the existing mining sectors at Combrin and Quinchy to the north. The Germans were well advanced underground here, by the time 170 companies set about their work, they were so close to the front line that 170 had to blow in a stretch of their own front line in order to re-engineer their position. It was a trying time for the infantry that had to live with the thought that any minute they might be blown to smithereens. Now, in the south, amongst those facing the Germans were the 17th and 18th divisions of French 9th Corps, who'd relieved 47th London Division around Luz at the end of September. Uh, many people think of Luz as being a wholly British battle, but in fact, uh, for three whole months, really, or October, November, December, um, the 9th Corps were actually in position for, for the whole of that period, actually underneath the village, so they had a considerable uh, amount of experience there. Although they put out saps in some quantity, most, oops, sorry, mostly at the Hill 70 side, they were quite shallow listening guys, but you can see they're actually coming out from the east of the Luz Crassier and moving round. So they're already sapping the Germans from that point. Now the war diary of the French 135th Regiment for the 31st of December offers something a little different. Now I've, I've actually put courtesy of the invasionzone.com forum members here. There's a discussion actually on that site about the possibility of German electrified barbed wire. Now, a quote from it, which is an interesting point, and I haven't actually followed it up, uh, but a quote from the French war diary says, Sector 85 and 87, two red lights looking like a star. These glows occurred beyond our trench, on the ground, and lasted for about two or three minutes. According to a gunner and the captain of the 10th Company, these lights were caused by French bullets hitting the enemy barbed wire, causing sparks. The captain thinks that the sparks are due to the electrification of the barbed wire. Now, it's some evidence within a war diary. We've nothing to substantiate it. And it could just maybe that the bullets were hitting the Christmas lights that was actually there. Um, because we were actually getting that report on the 31st of December, 1915. So we're now turning, if you like, the uh, yearly around. Uh, postcard here from 15th Scottish Division. But actually in January, 
The French were redeployed south, and once again, 47th Division came into the line, and the infantryman's defining role, which is to seize and hold ground, was now taking second place to that of the engineer, whose job it was to make sure the infantry was secure. Now, whilst the divisional field companies and pioneers laboured to consolidate the salient on the surface, bona fide tunnelling companies extended south to take over the French workings. Uh, here's a very interesting, uh, shall we say, aside from this, though, because it shows you the value of the pioneer companies. Um, 40, 47th Division Royal Pioneers, Royal, uh, 4th Royal Fusiliers, Welsh Fusiliers, completed what was called the Wrexham Tunnel under Luz Crassier. And it was begun by the French to protect the infantry against sniper fire as they crossed over the Crassier. And 4th uh, Royal Welsh Fusiliers took great pleasure in quadrupling the daily work rate of their French counterparts from one metre to four metres per day. Uh, the illustration on the right has got nothing to do with that, but it shows you the sort of humour there, Bakerloo to be, which would suggest that the 47th Londons have got something to do with that. Um, very active on that front, taking over. Now, also in January, within days of 4th Royal Welsh Fusiliers doing what they were doing, 173 Company were burrowing under the new sector, cops taken from chalk pit cops, uh, and many of the trenches sported a rather distinctive London flavour. Um, the underground fighting rose in intensity and iconically named mine craters soon began to appear, often named after officers of the infantry and engineer units. Here we can see Harrison's craters and Hart's craters, and uh, both of those were lieutenants in 173 Company. But clearly the men of 173 Company went to work on an egg on a regular basis, as eggs seem to feature quite a lot in that particular so you can see that the level of detail that went into the reports, notice the initial mine drives, which are the, uh, the Y-shaped and the singular-shaped, and then they are being linked by connecting tunnels known as laterals, which have been alluded to today, but at this stage it was more of a working towards rather than the finished article. So still progress going on, lots of things to do, but you can see the way system is developing. Within several weeks... The ground immediately south and east of Luz now comprised four distinct systems, double crassier, triangle, chalk pit cops held by 173, all three, and Hill 70, which was taken over by the newly formed 258 company. Now, meanwhile, tunnelling and mining was now happening at a frantic pace in the middle of the salient. I'm calling it the middle. Um, technically, it's slightly to the north, but I'm, I'm bearing in mind that I'm still counting Quincy and Combran as being the north of the sector because it was in the, the remit for the battle. Now, in this area, you've got Hohenzollern Redoubt, Border Redoubt, Hairpin Quarries, St. Elian Hullock, uh, Hulu, and I've overlaid this on a Google map to show the hot spots that actually have, have uh, actually um, sprung up in that particular point. Now, in here, we've got Hullock and St. Eli, Two quite famous hotspots, literally so, as miners of both sides took advantage of the geology to undermine the enemy quite relentlessly in this area. Um, here we've got one more. This is Hairpin, defended by 180 Tunnelling Company. There are 62 mines and camouflage fired by both sides between March and August 1916 in a, I would say, probably about a two to 250 yard stretch. Further up, we've got Border Redoubt and Hohenzollern Redoubt. You can see here the Western Front is literally becoming a necklace of mine craters. Um, this was now the peak period, June 1916, and it equated to the amount of mines fired one every two hours by both sides. Um, it's one the TV might say extreme engineering at this particular point. Here we've got a, a picture of the Hohenzollern Redoubt, probably taken after the war, and here also to the lip of the crater in that area. But then something strange happened. Just as it started, it stopped. Now, June may have had a, a mine firing every two hours somewhere on the Western Front. In the loose salient in the northern sector, Nobody fired any mines in August. So the Germans had simply stopped working, and as most of our mines were actually defensive at that time, we tended to as well. So when the scores on the doors, if you like, in August, not one mine was fired in that northern bit of the salient. 
Uh, these are two very well-known pictures. They're not necessarily loos. I think the one on the left gets used very, very often, but indicates, uh, uh, and the one on the right certainly not loos. It's probably in the Champagne region. What it does illustrate is just that we'd like to think that we'd beaten the Germans underground. We were certainly more flexible. We didn't timber everything in sight, we, regardless of whether it was needed. We made extensive use of laterals, and our systems extended much further, both left and right and front to rear. We weren't afraid to defend our tunnels from infiltration. So what was going on? Why did the mine count simply go to zero? Well, part of it was to do with some of these, Minenwerfers, and lots of them. And they were becoming increasingly accurate, indiscriminate. They were firing heavy calibers of mortar and containing a high percentage of gas as time went by. And they were being targeted increasingly on the British communication trenches in the loose salient. And being killed whilst moving to and from the front lines was now more likely than being killed in combat while you were there. The rate of attrition was increasing alarmingly. So, with that in mind, in order to mitigate against this, the inspector of mines, who ran the whole show, initiated a defensive scheme. And it started on the 1st of November 1916. And it had a number of aims. To link certain key fighting sectors together, to provide an uninterrupted defensive lateral under the front lines, complete with automated listening. It had to provide rear-to-front communications and facilities for infantry and engineers manning the front lines. And it needed to provide easy access for materiel and munitions with which to defend the front lines. Now, here's the southern part of the tunnel scheme linking the Hullock and St. Eli fighting systems as started by 253 Company, Royal Engineers. And here's what it would eventually contain. Now you can see here a generating station with lighting, later courtesy of the Australian Electrical, Mechanical, Mining and Boring Company, or colloquially known as the alphabets. Uh, ventilation and drying chambers with fans, usually positioned at entrances. Proto dugouts for ca gas casualty rescue, kitchens, latrines, and at some points, billets for over 100 troops. In fact, all the necessary facilities needed to live, move, and fight underground. Uh, just a little aside about the, the ABC company, uh, one of the largest generating stations on the Western Front was further up near Quincy on the canal, um, which we are trying, endeavouring to try and find, and would be a, an absolute find if we could do, um, but we've no, no progress there as yet. But anyway, moving on, this plan shows the underground front, the complete underground front. The actual defensive system is in bold as we go around. Developed during 1917, stretching from Mad Point to Hullock. Mad Point, for those of you who don't know, is an abbreviation of Madagascar Point. Now, in line with the defensive scheme of November 1916, at Chalk Pit Cops, 173 Company had started to put in a third level of tunnels, and it was called the Deep Deep. Um, they already had a main and a deep, so they couldn't really think what to call this, so they called it a Deep Deep. And it provided uninterrupted communication underground, together with a number of short subways on nearer to the surface. Um, the deepest of the tunnels was between 112 and 115 feet. And there uh, is plenty of evidence that the Germans were down that far too. Now, they would eventually be linked through under the Luz Crassier, which is here in today's money, if you like, to the Hill 70 sector beyond, which by the end of November had actually been taken over by Third Australian Tunneling Company. And that provided now a complete protection underground for Lewes Village from the south. Now I'll come on to 380C. They were originally formed from mining companies at Gallipoli. They arrived in France in May 1916 and they were working at Levante, further to the north of the Labazé Canal initially. And they quickly began to build on the success of their British counterparts, but were far from complimentary about those from whom they took over, 258 Company. Uh, privately thinking them lazy and lacking in verve. In fact, 258 had a difficult job at, two, at uh, Hill 70, probably the hardest of the sectors in the salient, 
and they later fought doggedly at 1918 when the Germans broke through on the list. So the Australians certainly brought a renewed sense of engineering vigour to the war. This at the time when military mining was waning as a tactical tool in the box, if you like. We'd already seen that mining, the actual explosions underground, had actually lessened dramatically. But in April 17, stung by defeats in front of Arras, and particularly at Vimy Ridge, the Germans did something that completely took the Allies by surprise, although it's probably not a very, very well-kept secret. They rationalised their line to the northeast and southeast of Luz. So here we see the front line. Coming down here would have been the original line. They pulled the whole line back, contracting it and ceding the suburbs of City Saint-Pierre and City Saint-Laurent the process. Now, in effect, overnight, all the work done at these four sectors was made redundant. And I think uh, some elements before, one of the talks before, talked about the redundancy when mining passes over, when troops pass over a mining, um, mm. what that must feel like for those involved in doing it. Uh, I would say that's pretty spiteful of the Germans to do that sort of thing. <laughs> Now, work immediately began in these sectors to salvage the material for future use. You can see this is Seaforth and Shoreditch craters on Hill 70. Uh, again, this would be a photograph taken some time after the war, um, effectively, uh, but it shows you the, the extent of the, of the re-engineering re that war has done to the landscape. But the Australians had a problem, because parts of the German old line, and a consequence their mine workings, now lay directly under the new British line. So, the German infantry were, in, sorry, this is Australian, so I've had to turn it round to actually get the right orientation. Now, through their own disguise, disguise workings, disused workings, they were actually causing havoc to the infantry, but they were infiltrating through their own tunnels. The answer was, on June the 6th, 1917, a raid, which was on the eve of Messine, let's face it, the Battle of Messine, to bomb the tunnels with mobile charges, and they closed them off to the Germans. And this effectively spelt the end of the German aggression underground in the southern portion of the Loose Salient. The price was high for Third Australian Tunnelling Company. Their CO, Major Coulter, was killed, shot through the head, together with his Batman. Now, by the end of the first week of August 17, they'd taken over more of the half of the salient. 173, 253 and 180 companies were redeployed elsewhere. So we can see they were a big company almost double the size of the British companies uh, and had a large frontage to actually deal with. Now, a week later, on the 15th of August 17, a diversionary attack by the two divisions of the Canadian Corps was launched against Hill 70. And the object was to inflict casualties, draw troops away from the Third Battle of Ypres, and if possible, prevent other reserves from being sucked up to Ypres. Now, the capture of the territory would be a bonus, but not a priority. And to support the attack, Australian tunnelers provided the Canadians with battle headquarters constructed off the chalk pit cops and a host of other supporting features. This is a, an area we've unfortunately not been getting into. The ground here is, is very shattered and uh, recent collapses have meant it's quite difficult to do anything with. Now, the battle is noted for the extensive use by the Germans of flamethrowers and poison gas, including the newly introduced Yellow Cross sulphur mustard. And they conducted 21 counter-attacks at least and inflicted 9,000 casualties on the Canadians. But it cost them 25,000 of their own. They took their objectives on Hill 70, but a later attack on Lons to the south failed completely. And due to a considerable manpower and material demands, they never again attempted to retake the lost ground at Lons. But as the attritional slogs of Passchendaele and Combray reached their inevitable conclusions, events in Russia were finally coming to a head. It had been clear from 1917 that Imperial Russia was doomed. War casualties to this point had been ruinous. And with the overthrow of the Tsar in February 17, and Lenin returned from his Swiss exile, supported, may I say, by the Germans, it was inevitable that a Bolshevik government would sue for peace. An armistice was thus signed on December the 15th, 1917, and peace negotiations began a week later. Well, well before this happened, alarm bells had started ringing in London, Paris, and probably Washington too. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of well-trained, rested German soldiers were available to commanders in the West. 
for an offensive that would knock the Allies out of the war before the Americans could arrive in force. It would certainly have happened in the spring, but where? Along the Western Front, preparations were hurriedly being put in place, accelerating and adding to the defensive scheme already underway. Third Australian Tunnelling Company planned this new subway, Hythe, under Hill 70, to the east of Lewes to reinforce their newly won consolidated positions. This slide shows the planned work being joined up with another subway to the south, Canteen, both being linked by a light rail. And here we have the plan dated June 1918, when the subway was complete, a major feat of engineering in record time. It also contained a cornucopia of defensive counter-infiltration measures. A few details. The gravel pit in 1917, which is here. At the gravel pit, bascule doors located at several entrances. The way this works is as a proper drawbridge. Germans coming down from the, from the inclines, from the entrances. This would then close. It would be open during normal operation. Germans and or munitions that they were throwing it in would come down and fall into the pit. Made of reinforced concrete and wood. Quite ingenious, quite medieval. Something else. A sliding door on a pulley. A block. Here we've got a traverse. We've got a pulley, which worked both ways. They actually developed it to either side. And look at this. A sniper hole. Truly medieval. And demolition charges placed in the floor of the tunnel close to them. Again, ingenious. We see down here, charge looking east. The charge was placed offset, tunnel here, down through the floor and offset. And I think this particular charge was something like 900 pounds. So, all this was designed and engineered and overseen by one man. Major Alexander Sanderson, with lots of gongs and bars after his name. And he took over command of 3rd Australian Tunnelling Company after Major Coulter's death back in the June. And I'm very delighted to welcome his grandson, Robin, here today in the audience. Robin, would you like to say just to... <laughs> Robin has been working with us in the tunnels and doing a lot of research behind the scenes and will be doing an awful lot more work in the next couple of years. Um, but effectively, uh, Charles Bean, the official historian of the, Australian, uh, uh, of the Australians in the Great War, put in this quote. He said, to the north of Lons, near Hullock, where I went through the workings with Sanderson, the whole defence of the front appears to be underground. The infantry garrison lives underground. Trench mortars and their crews are underground. The machine guns are underground. And for a mile behind it, the front line, the communication trenches are underground. Light railway delivers source to the gun emplacements by an even lighter railway, underground. But, as this is not all about tunnelling, the work didn't only place, take place underground. Right up until March 1918, hundreds of anti-tank craters were being blown in the Luz Valley between Hullock and Chalkpit Wood in the fear that German armour during its offences would choose that route for their attack. You can see here the practicing Third Australian Tunnelling Company building some of the pits and blowing some of the pits. A lot of the work was done uh, near St. Paul. Now, the offensive when it started on the 21st of March was swift, it was brutal, and it was overwhelming. But it didn't involve armour, and it wasn't within the loose salient, which is just as well, really. Because the keys to the demolition charges in High Subway weren't actually handed over to the infantry until the 12th of April. So if the Germans had got in, who knows? Now, by the end of August, though, a combination of overwhelming force and superb generalship, the Germans had shot their bolt, were on the back foot, and by early September, with red trenches turning blue at an astonishing rate, had withdrawn from the loose salient completely, in retreat towards the Belgian frontier. Within weeks, the first hundred years of our story had come to an end. The Great War of 1418, or 1490, was over. But the trail of destruction the Germans left behind them was staggering. Lille was described as a dead city on the edge of a desert. 
Hardly a building stood in the surrounding towns and villages, and those pitheads and pumping stations not destroyed by combat were ruthlessly incapacitated by their departure. Only four mines out of 107 had any form of working headgear. Wells were poisoned, forests burned and bridges blown. Thousands of inhabitants were forced marched from their homes in front of a retreating German army. After the armistice, a red zone was declared, a 30 kilometer strip of land either side of the front. Within this dead land, polluted from gas warfare, pockmarked with ordnance, riddled with tunnel entrances and shafts and littered with skeletal remains. Thousands of kilometers of barbed wire, trenches and craters had to be cleared, filled in and given time to heal. Operations to clean up the battlefields took over five years. Most of the clean-up operation was carried out by soldiers and prisoners of war, or former prisoners of war, and many civilian workers were also employed. And it took another five years before the land became agriculturally usable. Interesting, the local communities voted to keep all the old land divisions, those divisions that existed pre-war, despite protestations from the French authorities. Now, this is what and why the land layout today with its roads and fields, looks almost exactly the same. It didn't happen blanket-wise, it happened region for region, but we are extremely lucky in the loose salient that the road structures, the canal structures, the rail structures are so similar to what they were pre-war. But even today, the battle scars are evident. Here is a close-up of Munster Tunnel, or Munster Subway, almost forcing itself to the surface, to the left, you can see the corridor here. Now, this could purely be coincidence, but it looks pretty similar and it is exactly the same position. Industry, oops, sorry. Industry too recovered and the pre-war coal mining capacity was soon matched and massively exceeded. One man who helped this happen was Captain Francis Donald Tum Gurry of 173 Tunneling Company here whose specialised knowledge of deep coal mining in the Kent pits led to him being seconded to the British War Office in 1917 to help the French authorities plan for the regeneration of the coal fields after the war. And his grandchildren, all French by birth, still run the hugely successful business he set up outside Paris after the war, Compagnie Mico. Until I contacted them in 2014, they had absolutely no idea of his dangerous tunnelling exploits under the double crassier in 1916. But war is never far away from peace, and as the clouds of war loomed again, and closer in 1939, he says, the loose salient would once again play a small part, and brief, in a fascinating role of developments. In September 1939, the BEF had arrived in France, two corps, under Lieutenant General, later Field Marshal Sir Alan Brooke, were on the move and needed a rear headquarters whilst in the area north of Lens. Now, Alan Brooke was a gunner officer in the Great War and had himself planned the whole artillery barrage for the Battle of Vimy Ridge and in the loose salient thereafter. So he probably had a few secrets about the area tucked up his sleeve. But it fell to 240 Field Company Royal Engineers recruited from Glasgow to find a suitable venue, so to speak, for two corps rear headquarters. And they found it in the Hullock Tunnels. <laughs> but not content with simply utilising the space available, our lowland jocks set about completely re-engineering the whole underground system to accommodate the needs of a World War II rear headquarters. A vast honeycomb of new tunnels and chambers were cut and the spoil used to fill the existing tunnels and chambers. A quite extraordinary process that required not only their own company, but elements of the reformed 170 and 171 companies too. Some of the senior officers of these on the right, this is 170, may well have had a hand in digging the original tunnels in Hullock back in 1916. You really couldn't make this up. The whole build, as it were, took just over three months, and just as the electrics were about to go in, on May the 10th, 1940, the German forces invaded Belgium, and two corps were ordered, for, ordered forward to meet them. Dunkirk was the eventual outcome. German occupation of France followed, 
and the tunnels duly went back to sleep. Until we came along. Now, some of you may be wondering why I haven't blown the Duran Group trumpet too much in this talk so far. It's because we're only a small part of the story. Um, in fact, you could be thinking is that we are enablers for the next part of it, which is a short part, I'll just say the comment. <laughs> As some of you know, we've been working in the loose salient now for uh, the best part of four or five years, 2010, first at the bequest of the Loose Association, uh, the COPS tunnels, and then later at Hullock and Ain from the support, with the support of local authorities and the mayor and the people around. But it was towards the end of 2011 that the idea began to shape, shape in our minds about what it was we really wanted to contribute to do for the 2014-18 commemorations, which is where we all find ourselves today. Then it came to us from one of our Bibles of tunnelling military and mining, tunnellers by Captain W. Grieve, or Grant Grieve, sorry, and Bernard Newman, originally published in 1936 and recently reprinted by Naval and Military Press, on page 10, tucked away at the bottom, was a sentence that looked quite innocuous at first, but suddenly jumped out at us for the sheer audacity of its pretext. An uninterrupted lateral in front of our line extended from the Labaze Canal to Hullock, along which it was possible to walk underground for a distance of nearly four miles. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is really why we're here today. And I'm quite finished. Remember what I showed you very quickly at the beginning of the talk? Well, we're going to endeavour to organise our own sponsored walk in 2018 for forces charities. From Quincy on the Labaze Canal to Grenet, a distance of nearly 12 miles underground. We'll be taking in the sites. Oops. We'll be taking in the sights along the way, and we'll be telling the story of the salient as we go to whoever wants to hear it. And the plan is to take some of you with us. And when I say you, I mean representatives of associations that have an interest in military engineering, geology, and tunnelling and mining in general. And this might include historians, archaeologists, members of the armed forces, serving, retired, able-bodied, not so able-bodied. Now, we can't take everybody and we won't make choices until much later on this, but you'll also have to pass a physical and mental ability of individuals to make such a journey. But how, <laughs> but how or why under earth are we going to achieve this? Well, <laughs> it's our intention to carry on the work we've been doing since 2010 to open up the tunnels and the salient. Our first efforts, as you know, were at Chalk Pit Cops down here, just south of the village. Now, this is the, this is the real wind-up to tell you why we're, we're actually uh, able to do this. Well, using the expertise gained in over a decade at Vimy Ridge, we've succeeded in opening up the 112 feet deep, deep level of tunnels from a listening gallery near Luz Crassier to the junction to the triangle, double Crassier sector to the west. So we've opened the whole of the COPS system up. We've put five landing stations in to get down to it, 112 feet, 18 tonnes of infill, taken out by hand. And what we found at the bottom, rail tracks, mine chambers, uh, so we say possible mine chambers, some still tamped, uh, blockages, various uh, amounts of water. Incredibly, the water at that point, uh, when we broke into it in the May, by the end of September, uh, in May it was up to our knees, by September we couldn't get in because it was right up to the ceiling, and then three months later there was not a a patch of water in the whole system. So we are talking about an area here which has a very, very variable water table. Now, this complete mining sector, COPS, or chalk pit COPS, should we give it a bit more Australian treatment? <laughs> this shows you what we're up against in terms of access, how difficult it is in, a, in an area which is so semi-urban or urban to actually get access where and when we want. So we've got a lot of work to do in this southern Luz region. In the Hullock, City, St. Eli, quarry sectors, the focus of our efforts for the last two years, we've had some real good fortune getting into this system. We actually broke into the system within a weekend. Within two months, it had collapsed completely. Now, we had good fortune getting in. 
but we had to overcome some serious engineering issues while we were doing so. This represents two four metre railway sleeper shafts that we put into the access that we had already got but had collapsed in. So we dropped it in to this section, shored it up at the bottom, put a steel door on the top, filled it in with sandbags, and that's what we do for weekends, for pleasure. Now at the bottom, we've encountered some frustrations whilst exploring. Um, on the left here, you can see some graffiti by our Lowland Jocks of 240 company and a rather disconcerted uh, Paul Allison, one of our team leaders, faced with the fact that when they actually got down there, as I said earlier, they'd completely filled in most of the system to rebuild it in their own way. Um, this at the moment is giving us tremendous problems at the quarry sector because bad air seems to be circling around the system. But we've had some delights while we were doing so. And again, I'll draw your attention to the bottom right. Robin Dow here with us managed to take a photo of Granddaddy into the system and actually have himself photographed with it. Uh, some great graffiti, obviously one or two munitions that we keep clear of wherever we can. And here's a, just a bigger close-up. The roller block. Slightly different from the design, but we get the drift. But this is actually, a, a, would have been a working roller block at the time on pulleys, the pulleys are still available. The sniper hole, which I'm not quite sure, I think I've covered it with the picture, but the sniper hole is still there present. So, a few surprises. Here's another one, the remnants of a bascule door. So remember I told you about the bascule door from the surface? We found the top posts in one of the mine inclines coming down in Devon Tunnel. That's a future project we're going to be doing in the next couple of years to interpret the tunnels rather than simply walk through them. And we've made some good friends on the way. A lot of them French people, lovely people, been more than happy to help us out. Now, looking ahead, and I really am summing up now, by the end of quarter three next year, we hope to break into the Stansfield subway and access the mine lateral, the complete mine lateral at Hairpin and work our way back to a blockage that is stopping us progressing through bad air at the quarries. Um, hairpin and quarries feature very heavily in the, in the subtext about uh, the battles between uh, 1916 and 1917. We have actually got the entrance to Stansfield. Sorry, did I show you Stansfield there? We've actually got the entrance to Stansfield. We've put pea shingle bags in the way to actually um, uh, prevent access through to it, which we hope to be opening up in January, February. This just lets you look at the overlay of the tunnel system at quarries. This runs directly over some very heavily cratered area. It's probably one of the most cratered areas. Again, a whole bunch of of craters there to see. Uh, we actually have a blockage. At, we got through a blockage at C recently. We, we've now encountered another blockage at E. But if we can get through that in January, February, we will be going straight all the way up to Hairpin. Moving forward, we want to push forward towards Border Redoubt, which is after Hairpin. And after that, we are on towards Hohenzollern, for which we have permission from the landowner to do what we want under his land. So by the end of the year, we hope to be able to return to Hill 70 and also do some work at Quinchy and continue where we left off at Hyde Subway and also some more work at Hill 70. Now, quarter two, 2017, we're going to be t turning our attention to Triangle in the south and the very far Quinchy in the north, uh, two smaller tunneling company sectors but considered quite difficult by us so we're leaving it a bit later to get more information on it and unfortunately we probably have two uh, oh, I'll just mention no I'll go through this I'll, triangle which just gives you an idea of where we are that looks like the mine crater there's a, a definitely a, a, an area there that's actually uh, very inundated something and here at uh, the brick stacks up at Quinchy Coldstream and Old Kent subways there is absolutely nothing left of the Brickstacks area. It is as flat as a fluke. It's been completely redeveloped since the, the war. Uh, there is nothing to see. The only detritus is that which has been dumped through reconstruction of the area, through re-engineering of the area. So all this stuff you see here is all post-war. Right, to conclude, our two problem areas. Chalk pit wood area and double crassier. And you can see both left and right the problems we will face here. It could well be that our walk cannot achieve some of the things we want to do, but we can still do it overground. So 
When I say we're going to walk underground for 12 miles, we might end up walking underground for half a mile <laughs> and doing 11 and a half miles <laughs> overground. I'm hoping not. I think we'll be a substantial amount. But at the end of the day, there may be areas where, from an engineering point of view, even we can't actually make it happen. Now, I was said at the beginning, and, and this is the conclusion, that the lose battlefield is largely forgotten. It's been a real disappointment to us that this is the case. Because without knowledge, we can't press the case for preserving it and interpreting it to the millions of school children, and I heard the discussion earlier, who largely pass it by. This they do as they travel from Ypres to the Somme on their lightning tours. Maybe they get a chance for a, a, a loo break at Vimy if they're lucky. But they don't really have a thought for how the battlefield of Lewes, both for the battle and what took place afterwards, fits into the very steep learning curve that the British Army had to go through in what was effectively its first set-piece battle, set battle. But there again, what I would say is it's up to the teachers. All of us here are teachers in one way or another to teach. So school children won't do anything on their own. They need leadership from us. Right, the tunnels are largely irrelevant in this respect. It's doubtful that most of them, unlike, for instance, the Grange at Vimy Ridge, will ever be fully open to the public on a commercial basis. And this is simply because of the cost of making them affordably health and safety compliant in an increasingly litigious world. It's a great shame that an area so visually iconic as the Quincy Brick Stacks, for instance, no longer exists. But there again, perhaps some red zones simply can't be fixed by the healing hands of time. At Hill 70, parts of the battlefield have become airfields, shopping centres, and even a maximum security prison. Um, Urbanisation, if you like, comes at a price. But there's also plus points to be had. Some elements of the old battlefield remain relatively untouched. For all the complaints about land usage at the Hohenzollern Redoubt, much of the cratered areas are as they were left 100 years ago. And they're still havens for wildlife although one might say uh, the French usually try and change things there. This is also true at Hairpin, where the German trenches have mellowed in appearance over the last 100 years, but are still there to be walked over, complete with tunnel entrances. So I'm going to go back and just remind ourselves of what our definition here was, and I'm sure you've got all that, but I'm going to add something else, because another definition is the action of working artfully to bring something about. And what I can say then, ladies and gentlemen, is that we are artfully trying to engineer the walk we want to do in 2018, and for that we need your help and your support. And I thank you for listening to me this afternoon. If you want to find the private, I know where he is. He's hanging on the old barbed wire. I saw him, I saw him hanging on the old.